All right, so uh, next up we have Ben Radford, who's going to talk a little bit about that a really, really bad movie that everybody was waiting for for a very long time. And then we all were disappointed because somebody got nuked in a fridge and they survived, and uh, other bad things happened, and like ghosts were real or shit like that. I don't know. But Ben's going to talk about this because he's an ex expert on everything Indiana Jones. Okay, <laughs> Ben Radford. We'll, we'll go with that, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that half-assed introduction, Derek. Appreciate that. <laughs> Very kind of you. Accurate. Yeah, sure, there you go. <laughs> uh, normally I prefer to, uh, to stand at a podium, but I was told that uh, we don't have a podium, so uh, that this is why. It's probably, probably easier for the camera folks as well, so that's, that's fine. Um, so yes, I'll be talking about a... Uh, a investigation that I recently completed about a year or two ago. It's actually a, one of the chapters in my, my new book, Mysterious New Mexico, uh, which is floating around. I'll be doing an a autographing session, I think, tomorrow at 4 or something. So, uh, so anyway, this will be sort of a, a little primer for, the, uh, for that chapter. And also, uh, as, as, as Derek mentioned, uh, of course, crystal skulls are uh, widely uh, known primarily, primarily through the Indiana Jones film, and I'll be talking a little bit about um, a little about Lucas, uh, George Lucas, and his um, his interest in that. So, uh, I have a uh, I've got a an actual crystal skull here uh, to my left, uh, and a fake uh, non crystal skull. This is actually from the Indiana Jones uh, uh, shop at at uh, Disney World Land, one of the two. Uh, so that's uh, that's 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 as close as I could come to the Indiana Jones one, which is just as well because you know again the movie was not great. Let's be honest. So, um, without further ado, again, this is, uh, this is who I am and some of what I do, so we can go start with there. I'm the deputy editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine. I'm also a research fellow at, at uh, CSI, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. I'm a columnist for Discovery News and LifeScience.com, and author or co-author of seven books, most recently, Mysterious New Mexico. Uh, and I do a variety of investigations into everything from... Uh, Monsters, uh, ghosts, uh, psychics, uh, this, that, and the other. So I'll be talking, uh, on, I think tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, on the organ theft urban legends. If you're interested in that, the, the kidney theft. It's uh, some really interesting stuff. So if you want to, stop on by. So, and kidney, yeah, bring your kidneys. <laughs> and donate blood. Of course, we have the, the, blood, the blood donation. Uh, so crystal skulls. Now. Why, why, would a, why would any given skull be especially interesting because it's crystal? Well, one, one reason is that uh, crystal skulls are among the strangest and most mysterious artifacts in the world. Uh, they've been seen in some of the world's finest museums. Uh, there's a, I saw a crystal skull in the British Museum in London. It's a beautiful piece. I'll show you a photo of that. Um, and it's just an amazing piece of work, regardless of whether it has any uh, you know, pseudoscientific or paranormal hooey about it. Uh, inspired in Indiana Jones, and according to legend, have, has been uh, used to do all sorts of things from seeing the future to killing people at a distance. Uh, so, you know, like hold up a skull and, you know, I curse you! And then this, they're like, I think lights and like lightning is supposed to come out. Uh, I might, that could have been a movie. I don't know if it's a documentary. Uh, I think it was on Discovery Channel, so it could really could be the one. Um, but it did not have sharks in it. You're thinking the other one. Uh, so this is uh, this film here, uh, Indiana Jones and the, the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, is probably where most people uh, uh, in, in the public have heard about crystal skulls outside of the New Age movement. Uh, they're very popular among New Agers, and I'll talk about that in a second. Here's Indy's crystal skull. Again, this is actually the one here. Um, uh, it is neither crystal nor, of course, a skull, uh, but, you know, artistic license. <laughs> so... Make that what you, it's a little small, there you go. This is Dan's crystal skull. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, yes, uh, some, some liquor aficionados, of which there are many here, uh, uh, will recognize this. This is a uh, crystal head vodka uh, produced by paranormal buff uh, Dan Aykroyd, who of course uh, was in Ghostbusters and many other Many other uh, uh, both uh, fictional and pseudoscientific uh, stories and documentaries. 
Uh, the the vodka is actually not too bad. It's uh, for those who don't know, it's made from iceberg water, if I'm not mistaken. Dan is Canadian, um, and when I was in Newfoundland um, about ten years ago, I was looking, I was doing some research. Uh, I was actually looking for um, for giant squid. Um, uh, giant squid have actually washed up. Uh, in a handful of places around the world, usually places that begin with new, as in New Zealand and Newfoundland. Just a little little thing. So I was actually partly there to, to look into the giant squid that had washed up there. And uh, they're like, have you tried our local uh, local local uh, vodka, eh? I'm like, yeah, oh, sure. And so anyway, it's, it's not bad vodka. It's not great, but it's not bad. Here's the British Museum's uh, skull. It's uh, It's probably the most impressive crystal skull in the world. Um, and it's, uh, I've forgotten exactly how many pounds, I think it's like uh, seven and a half pounds or so. Remarkable piece there, and that's what it looks like from the side. Um, it's made of uh, in, entirely, uh, entirely of, of, of crystal, there's no glass in it, it's also one piece of crystal, which is uh, particularly impressive. Uh, there's also New Age skulls from Sedona. Uh, there's a, that's where I got this little miniature crystal skull there. I could have gotten the bigger one, but frankly it wasn't worth my money. Uh, the smaller one does its job, uh, but it's amazing the, the sorts of crystal skulls you see. Uh, here's another uh, crystal skull uh, that's available for sale in Sedona, Arizona. Uh, they're just all over the place there. Uh, there's uh, three different types of crystal skulls available uh, at the place called the Center for New Age Enlightenment or something or other uh, in Sedona, Arizona. There's uh, rutilated uh, quartz, uh, clear quartz, and smoky quartz. And you can see various skulls of varying quality. Uh, <laughs> people, who, you know, I can just, oh, yeah, there you go. That's good enough. There you go. Uh, I'll sell to the tourist. But so you can see there's quite a variety of, of skulls there. So, <laughs> so here's the question. Why crystal skulls? Anybody recognize the, the image there on the right? Warren Zevon, yes, it's uh, one, of, one, of, one of my favorites there. Anyway, a little tribute to Warren. So why crystal skulls? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is that, of course, uh, the, uh, you know, crystal is one of the most popular New Age uh, items. Um, New Agers have constructed an intricate belief system surrounding crystals, involving auras, reincarnation, chakras, vibrations, and so on. Uh, if you spent time around New Agers, as I have, and you don't necessarily need to because I'll do it for you, um, there's lots of uh, harmon harmonic stuff and energies, and this, this quartz will, will suck out the evil energies and put in the good ones. All sorts of, 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 um, of uh, different pseudoscientific stories and, uh, and qualities attributed to quartz specifically. Uh, Katrina Raphael, author of Crystal Enlightenment, says, Down through the ages, civilizations have used the power of crystals and stones for many purposes. The oldest legends and lore of crystal magic lead us back to the ancient continent of Atlantis. Uh, we could, of course, include the fictional uh, uh, ancient continent of Atlantis, but we'll, we'll, we'll let that go. Well, crystals were used to channel and harvest the cosmic force. Yes, the cosmic force. This legendary civilization, <laughs> legendary advisedly, of advanced sciences would use crystals as beacons of light that would serve as telepathic communicators to the universal forefathers. I don't know what any of this means. I'm just reading it. They also use crystal, crystal power for many physical and practical purposes. The power and potential of crystals cannot be overstated. It is one of the main contributors to the new age. Indeed it is. Uh, here's a, a woman being treated with crystals. Um, there's, there's a handful of crystal. Yeah, they, they do different things. You place different crystals, different parts of the body. Uh, they're supposed to do things for you. They adjust your auras. Um, there's, there's books and books written on what exactly you're supposed to use the different crystals for. Uh, some people say that a smoky quartz uh, crystal is, is better for, uh, for dealing, for example, with problems with the head. I was thinking, you know, like, gullibility. Um, uh, <laughs> Or, or whatever, maybe the, the clear ones are more for the chest, I don't know, take your pick. So, Crystal Skulls Incorporated. So, crystals are also used for scrying and prophecy, where people uh, light it, interpret the form they see. Um, crystal Skulls are at the center of a large cottage industry within New Age circles, and there's all sorts of books, DVDs, seminars, uh, newsletters, videos, uh, I've seen dozens of them. Uh, Tours, yes, there you go. And uh, people will sometimes pay $100 or more to simply be in the same room 
with a crystal skull. Now, there is a crystal skull here. I'm not going to charge you extra. I just want, so don't worry about that. There's not going to be an added charge on the bill. I just want to let you know that there is one here. So if, <laughs> you're welcome. That's right. Yes, you need to donate to, to Margaret's thing there. So, uh, so, so that sort of gives you an idea of why crystal and why skulls, right? So uh, I'm going to talk about a particular crystal skull uh, that was, has associated with New Mexico, the, the, the uh, state that I live in and where I wrote most of the book about. So people in San, New Mexico, San Luis Valley still talk to this day of a mysterious crystal skull that was found there nearly three decades ago. It all started on a hot summer afternoon in 1995 when a rancher named Donna Coach found a, a, a mysterious light. The story is that she'd been uh, enjoying a warm February day riding her ATV along the fence line of her new ranch. She was accompanied by the former caretaker, a teenager who lived uh, nearby, 60 yards from the highway in the middle of nowhere, basically, uh, out by a ranch. The young man noticed a glint of sunlight from the ground and stopped to investigate. He called for Dana to come see. She braked her ATV and turned back. He was grinning holding a glittering object in his hand, the sunlight refracting beams of light around him. That's not actually the crystal skull. That's uh, taken not far from my house for a little dramatic effect there. Because, <laughs> you know, wh why wouldn't I, right? So here, here's, here's where it gets weird. This wasn't the weird part. Here's where it gets weird. At first glance, it didn't look remotely human. The skull is six inches high and three and a half inches wide, appears to have been created from a single piece of molten glass, yet crystal. Hmm. Odd. It does not appear to be carved. Its, its unique form doesn't suggest a, uh, a typical uh, skull. It's highly stylized. The asymmetric nature could be significant and unique. The smooth, graceful lines flow effortlessly through the form, suggesting to one viewer a prenatal feminine quality. Was it been sand by any chance? It was, yes. It was desert scrub sand. Now, he, here's a photograph of, of the San Luis skull. Now, I have a, a, a replica of the San Luis skull in this bag. Now, again, according to some people, uh, the power of this skull that I have in this bag might kill us all. <laughs> so I, I just want to be, if you're concerned about this, you can leave now. I won't fault you for it. You know, I, I would be concerned about the energies, frankly, swirling around. There's lots of lights in here. Things could explode. Uh, do you want to see it? Do you want to see it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 this is the $100. This is the $100, exactly. So, before I take it out, I just want to warn you again. Skulls exactly like this have been known to kill. Uh, he kill, heal, whatever else. Now, for, for your safety, I have actually encased it in another object. I have actually put it in... Ziploc. <laughs> now, don't underestimate the power of Ziploc to stop uh, mystical energies. Uh, it's, it, it works against terrorists, exactly. So I'm actually, against my better judgment, I'm actually going to pass this around and let you touch it. Yes, now, now, if you steal it or if you drop it, you'll be cursed. Well, besides that, you'll piss me off and you'll wish you were cursed. So, um, so I'll let someone pass that around. And again, this is an exact replica of the San Luis skull that I'll be talking about. Are you feeling any weird energies? Are you okay? I'm feeling weirdness in here right She's now. feeling weirdness. All right. Is there a doctor? Oh, okay. All right, there you go then. So here's a here's a San Luis skull. So, so what happened was that. Uh, this rancher in, uh, in actually, it's the, the San Luis Valley borders both uh, Colorado and, and New Mexico, southern Colorado. So she sees this, and she's like, what is this weird thing? It's some sort of crystal, powerful, new age thing. My God, you know, what is this? So she gets online, and of course, where do you find the answers to these things? Google, right? So she's like, oh, let me Google it. There must be good information there. <laughs> so... When she, when she tries to figure out what exactly she might have found, um, she says, you know, that's just disrespectful. Don't put the, don't put the skull there. That's not, that's just, that's just awkward. Oh, never mind. I'm, if it's on your Facebook page, that's fine. Okay, so, so, so Donna <laughs> doing the selfie with the skull. See, this is what I'm reduced to. 
I'm trying to keep you all informed about crystal skulls here, and you're, okay, fine. So, so Donna finds this magical mystical, mystical skull that's being passed around, and she looks online, and she looks around, and, uh, and she said, what does she find? Well, she finds, there we go. She finds that there was yet another crystal skull, a most famous crystal skull in the world. It is the skull of doom. Doom, yes. This is the information that she finds when she's trying to research her own crystal skull. Here's the story about it. Arthur C. Clarke called it the weirdest gem in the world. One of a handful of strange man-made objects that have challenged the ingenuity of the world's scientists. It's a detachable skull composed of two pieces, including a jaw, made of clear crystal quartz. It's just over five inches high, five inches wide, and it weighs 11 pounds, seven ounces. And this is the skull that she found. It's actually known as the Mitchell Hedges skull. I'll talk about that in a second. And there it is. That is the skull of doom. It's the most famous crystal skull in the world. And again, this is what, when she was trying to research her own crystal skull, this is what she found. So the story behind the Mitchell Hedges skull was that it was found by this guy here, F.A. Mitchell Hedges, uh, who was sort of a, uh, sort of a, a, sla a ne'er-do-well slash Indiana Jones wannabe. Uh, and he, uh, he, was a, he was a sort of a part-time archaeologist. There's him on the, on the, on the left there uh, doing some uh, research in uh, British Honduras, which is now Belize. And he sort of fancied himself a, uh, again, sort of Indiana Jones uh, prototype. And, uh, but the story gets even stranger because that actually, depending on who you talk to, it's not Mitchell Hedges himself, but his young daughter Anna who found the skull. And that's her there in the middle there. So here's the story of the Skull of Doom. One day in 1927, a year after Houdini died, for those who are keeping track, <laughs> Anna Mitchell Hedges was, was assisting her adoptive father, British explorer F.A. Mike Mitchell Hedges, in his excavations in the ruined Mayan city of Lubantun, British uh, Honduras now Belize. It was her 17th birthday, and Anna and some local Maya children scaled one of the steep pyramids. An almost blinding light came from deep below her in a hidden and ruined chamber. It was something bright, a reflection, she later recalled, hitting me in the face, but I didn't know what it was. Drawn to the beguiling, almost entrancing glow, Anna wanted to investigate. You go, girl. She was told, no, no, you can't do that. But eventually, her stubborn persistence, the gumption this girl showed, convinced her stubborn father to let her investigate. That's not her, uh, but it's, it's, it's pretty close to her. They lowered, this is, this is her story. This is, this is her story. They lowered me to with two ropes. They put towels under the ropes so they wouldn't hurt me. Inch by careful inch, they lowered the brave girl into the musty darkness of the ruins. She says, I was so terrified. There were, there were scorpions and other, other awful things there. I saw the skull. I picked it up and stuffed it in my shirt, and they, and they pulled me up. Salute. So, <laughs> she brings up this skull, and according to one story, after she brought it up, she held it aloft dramatically. What do you think happened? Every, well, no, come on, <laughs> skeptics, God. No, 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 you're, 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 you're ahead of the story. She held it aloft, and all the indigenous Maya suddenly bowed down to it, just like in the movies. Yeah, we'll get to that. So, uh, so this, this is how the skull, depending on who you talk to, came into the possession of Anna Mitchell Hedges. Uh, he wrote about the skull in his 1954 autobiography, Danger, My Ally. <laughs> I, guess I, should, I should use that as a title. That'd be awesome. He said the skull is at least 3,600 years old, 3,600 years old, and according to legend, was used by the high priest of the Maya when performing esoteric rites. It is said, I love it is said, that, that you know what, whatever follows it is said must be true. It is said that when he willed death with the help of the skull, death invariably followed. It has been described as the embodiment of all evil. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, so give it to his daughter, right? Here you go, honey. Go play with that. Hope it doesn't kill you. Don't tell your mom. 
So according to the book, Mysteries of the Crystal Skulls Revealed, the Maya told them that the crystal skull was used by a high priest to will, will death or to heal. For example, if a medicine man or witch doctor was getting too old to perform the religious ceremonies, a young man was chosen to take his place. Then, at the appropriate time, like 3 p.m. Eastern, I think, um, most of them would, would lie in front of the altar with a crystal skull on top of it, and the high priest would perform a ceremony in which the old man's knowledge would transfer him to the boy. And the medicine man would peacefully pass on, and the boy would immediately become very knowledgeable. Here is the aged uh, Anna Mitchell Hedges. This was taken about, about 10 years ago. She moved to, um, she moved, uh, to uh, St. Catharines, Ontario, actually not far from Buffalo, New York. She's now dead, but that's, that's, that's her, and that's her crystal skull there. So this is, this is the mischief, mischievous young sprite, or old sprite. So... More, more on the Skull of Doom. So again, this is the most famous crystal skull in the world, uh, and it was widely uh, examined uh, by many people, including crystal skull expert, I think you can get that online, I don't really know, uh, who studied the skull for six years, concluded that it had mysterious powers. Quote, it sometimes changed color or filled with a cottony haze. It produced an elusive perfume and strange tinkling sounds. I can't make this up, that uh, images of mountains, temples, and other objects appeared within it, and an aura once surrounded it for several minutes. Stories began circulating about the mysterious crystal skull. Uh, for example, the first time they were kept, in, they were kept they, there was two particular researchers, uh, Frank and Mabel, uh, kept, kept the skull overnight in their home. They were awakened by unusual noises in the home, including a jungle cat. Does anybody know what jungle cat sounds like? Just sort of creeping, I don't really, like a roar, like a, okay. Is there, is there only one sound or is there a variety of sounds that jungle cats make? There you go, okay. Silver bells tinkling softly and chimes. The next morning possessions were scattered all over their living room. This is actually more, clo more closely associated with poltergeist. Yet the, all the windows and doors were locked. So Frank Dorland in 1970 said, hey, I have this amazing crystal skull. Let's see what the scientists have to say about it. So he took it to Hewlett Packard Labs, which is a good start. They're certainly qualified. And he said another puzzling detail is that no matter what temperature the researchers subjected the Mitchell Hedges skull to, it always remained 70 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the findings were so astounding that one of the crystallographers at Hewlett Packard was quoting as saying, the damn thing just shouldn't be. I can picture him having a heart attack just shortly afterwards. <laughs> they said that the workmanship was exquisite and that if it was made using sand and water, it could have required an estimated 300 man years of effort. 300 man years, that's, that's, some, that's some dedication. Uh, you know, think about that for a second. Again, if it was made using sand and water, we'll just, we'll just qualify that. Uh, many skull enthusiasts and psychics spend countless hours in the, pro in the presence of these skulls meditating it and receiving wisdom and visions and talking to it. Uh, there's, uh, there was one woman who was talking about how uh, there were extraterrestrial space brothers who were, who were, uh, who were uh, communicating through her. Another person said that it was actually a, um, it was actually a, uh, a, it was a real skull, even though it looks not, doesn't look like a human skull, but it was a, an Atlantean princess, because you gotta bring Atlantis into it. So, so there you go. The crystal skulls quickly transformed from curious artifacts to the center of a lucrative new age business. Crystal skull writers offered everything from photos of the skulls to miniature replicas, books on messages and wisdom written from the skulls and so on. So for example, a psychic would, 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 uh, would spend a couple days, a couple hours uh, in sort of communicating in silent, uh, maybe with or without drugs, I don't know. Uh, telling, oh, tell me the story is what you have to say. So they, they, she would essentially write a, a, book, a book or a pamphlet and then say, well, here's my book. This is what was communicated. Sort of essentially channeling, uh, channeling operation. One Mayan priest who owned the crystal skull offered to let those interested work with the skull for $500 a week or $50 a day per researcher. So, you know, you got five people in there, you're, you're racking it up. So the, again, this is all, just, just keep it in mind, this is all information that Donna Couch is, is, is learning about other, um, other of these uh, crystal skulls, trying to figure out what, what she might have discovered mysteriously uh, on this remote place near her ranch in Colorado. One researcher, Nick Nosrino, said he received visions showing pictures of uh, highly civilized societies, one that lives underwater, 
a second lives with, with one within the earth, and a third one which comes from another planet other than our earth. Each time there was a change, there appeared to be spaceships which removed people. Apparently not enough of them. Um, the spaceships returned at a later date when the land was stable and people came out of them. The Mitchell Hedges skull seems to take me to civilizations that could not exist on our planet, he said. For me, the skull is like a compact computer with a video monitor and often with accompanying audio sounds. And this is my favorite. A psychic named Sandra Bowen uh, spent nearly a month communicating with this crystal skull. With the help of two extraterrestrial alien friends named Akbar and Jehoshaphat, because why wouldn't they be named Akbar and Jehoshaphat? Bowen said that uh, the skull said that its favorite color was purple. Do, do, not, do not question the psychic. Please. Have some respect. All right. The crystallization of, Sha was of Shatri's skull, a high priestess of Atlantis, with the help of space beings, uh, capitalization in the original, I should add, uh, using the power of their minds and, and laser beams emanating from their eyes, they were able to crystallize her skull. Pure, pure pseudoscience, of course. So this is the background to the most famous crystal skull that, that she, uh, she was researching in order to figure out what hers was. So this is what she discovered. It was, one of, it was apparently one of only a few in the world and uh, possibly holding the key to unknown paranormal powers. Again, it could heal, it could kill, you could do whatever, whatever you want. So after reading these, these heady, sensational stories of other crystal skulls, she became convinced that her crystal skull uh, was uh, the one that's being passed around, uh, was indeed supernatural. She said that the, uh, the, the uh, skull mysteriously repelled dirt as if a pulsing aura or energy kept contaminants at bay. It was all clean and shiny when I found it, she said, but I've since discovered it doesn't get dirty. It always looks the same. Uh, and so what happened was, the, again, she finds this thing, and it's new agey. People are coming from far and wide. Psychics will come, say, can I please you know, spend time with the skull? She's like, sure, put the money over there. Uh, I, I wish that I could have been on this. Um, one psychic told her not to sleep with the skull and to keep it wrapped in cloth in a cedar box. Not to sleep with it. That's a... Maybe the psychic was right on that count. I don't, I don't know. None of my business, for, frankly. She believed that the crystal skull was cursed, in fact. She said, some people are plumb scared of it when they see it. A friend came to see it. Now she won't step foot in our property. Probably because you're crazy. Um, oh, my God. Her son, who had volunteered to remove the skull from the ranch and take it to town to have it examined by an expert, was accidentally hit on the head with a hammer. <laughs> Accidentally, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, this is solving itself as I go along, isn't it? Um, other phenomena echoed what Coach had read about the, the skull of doom, such as uh, in other people's experiences. Some were subtle and mysterious, hard to define or prove, such as strange feelings and smells. Uh, one person uh, told her that the skull is very old. It is not, not man-made, not of this earth. You must be very careful with it. It can be very detrimental. You must be balanced or you'll be hurt. Sounds kind of vaguely threatening there. So as, as, as the skull sort of made the rounds in the, uh, in, in the New Age communities, uh, again, people were coming to her. She was becoming something of a celebrity um, in, in, uh, in around Denver. And eventually someone said, well, let's take this to people who actually know what they're talking about. For example, the Denver Museum of Natural History. And they confirmed a couple of things. They said, well, it's actually glass, not crystal, so let's just get rid of that right there. Uh, and of course, this immediately diminishes the skull's significance because, of course, as I pointed out at the beginning, the reason why New Agers are so, so excited about crystal is that it ha presumably has these properties. Glass, which, you know, is on our vehicles every day and everywhere else, and you see through it in windows, is not, doesn't really have the same associated uh, folklore about it. Uh, so if it wasn't made from crystal's quartz, then of course there's no reason to think that it has any, any of the attributes that, that crystal has. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's quartz specifically, not glass or granite or any other, in, granite or any other mineral the New Age say, that New Age experts say has special powers. So then the question is, well, hold on here. If it was glass, then who would have made it and why? Why was it out here essentially in the middle of nowhere, 
on this on this mesa uh, in rural uh, rural Colorado. I mean, what what's it doing there? It's not downtown somewhere. It's not a museum. It's there. Well, as it happens, glass skulls are not unusual uh, in folk art, and they can be found for sale in art in curio places around Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and elsewhere, particularly Arizona. But then the question is, well, hold on, if it was a piece of art, why was it there? Uh, you know, why would it be sitting out on the ground that way? And if it, it was a piece of art, most artists, they, they, they sign their work. This is, this is made by me. You know, if it's an oil painting, they do that. They leave a mark, whatever else. It had nothing, uh, nothing like that. Well, in, ta in fact, the solution came that uh, at, the, at the museum they said, well, oh, you know, I think I know who made this. So the, the skull, the San Luis skull, was not the severed head of Atlantean princess. I know that will shock you. Nor was it from aliens or civilizations. It was from a guy named Brad Chavez. Brad, yeah. Brad, Brad made the skull. I talked to Brad. The Atlantean princess. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Here's what had happened. Here, here, here's how this whole, this whole story unraveled. The Denver glassblower, Brad Chaudez, owned a piece of vacant property up in Colorado, which happened to border Donna Coach's ranch. Uh, and sometimes he and his, his wife, who's unfortunately now deceased, uh, they were planning to build their dream house there. And so he says, quote, this is what he told me when I tracked him down, interviewed him. He said, we left one of my skull paperweights. Yes, skull paperweights as a kind of cornerstone where we would be building the house, he said. I'd been making those for days. When me and my wife got together, we used the Day of the Dead fairs, which are fairly common throughout Mexico and the Southwest, to sell them. This was about half size. It was really awful for one of my paperweights. The mouth went wrong, and so it was technically one of my seconds. As it's being passed around, you can maybe see why. So Donna's Ancient, mysterious, magical crystal skull was neither ancient, nor mysterious, nor magical, nor crystal. <laughs> kind of pours a little cold water on the whole thing, frankly, if you ask me. But then, well, hold on here. If, if this was a defective glass paperweight, instead of Atlantean princess's mystical skull, then what's with all the reputed stories about it? What about all the people who are like, oh, let me see this. Oh, I'm getting visions of ancient... What are you talking about, dude? It's a paperweight. So surely something is, is unexplained, right? Well, the fact is that if you take a closer look at the, the claims surrounding the skull, uh, many of them vanish once, once you look more closely at them. For example, uh, take her claim that the skull was clean and shiny when she found it. It doesn't get dirty. Well... Any round, smooth glass piece, such as that one, will naturally repel dirt because it's smooth glass. I mean, if you, if you, if you, you know, cover it with dirt, yeah, it'll have dirt on it. But if, you're, if it's out in the wind, then, yeah, it's, it'll be unusually clean because it's glass. There's nothing mysterious about that. Uh, so many of the mysterious events that, that, that Donna Coach attributed to the crystal skull uh, were likely simply coincidences. You know, she was simply making the common psychological assumption uh, of assuming that anything that anything that was weird or unusual must have been must have been attributed to the skull. I mean this is a common fallacy called post hoc ergo propter hoc, which it means in Latin it means after this, therefore because of it. So for example, if if you if you believe in curses and superstitions and someone says, you know, um, uh, the the crazy old lady down the road said that you're cursed, uh, and for a hundred dollars she can take the curse off, but you know if you don't have the hundred dollars, then you're in trouble. If you really believe you're cursed, then you will look for things. Oh my God, I had a flat tire. Well, everybody, everybody has a flat tire at some point, but you're going to attribute it to. Well, this must be part of the curse. Something bad happened to me, and so it, that's that's how psychology works. And so, you know, uh, people make connections where they don't exist, and they assume that two unrelated events are somehow linked by cause and effect. Um, and so, you know, there's there's all sorts of bad things that happen to people all the time uh, that they wouldn't necessarily have thought or part of any sort of collective magical or, or pseudo-mystical uh, connection to any skulls, except, of course, that, that they, that it's the power of suggestion. So let's get back to the skull of doom, the, uh, the most famous crystal skull in the world that, that Donna was researching that actually helped convince her. Uh, and actually, this, this is part of a, a very common phenomenon where someone will find something unusual. 
Uh, I, I came across this a lot in my, in my chupacabra research. Uh, as some of you know, I did a, a research in the chupacabra, the vampire beast. And what will happen is that someone will find some sort of weird dead thing. It doesn't look like anything they recognize. It's not obviously a dog. It's not obviously anything else. So what do they do? They go, they go online, they type in weird dead thing, and chupacabra pops out. And then some local guy says, well, yeah, it must be a chupacabra. It's Texas, you know, whatever else. And then the next thing you know, so then a local reporter calls the chupacabra. And then I have to hear about it again. Uh, and then I have to explain those. But, but this is a very common phenomenon where people will they'll, they'll find something weird. And what they do, they Google it. And because they're not looking for good skeptical information, either because they don't know what's out there, they just don't know what to look for it. The, but the vast majority of the information out there, whether it's crystal skulls, psychics, Bigfoot, chupacabras, whatever else, is very, is very believer-oriented. It's very gullible. It's not very scholarly and scientific, so that's the information they get. So, that, so it's, it's actually not, it's not surprising that she came to the conclusion that her, her skull was magical, mystical, because that's what, that's what she saw. I mean, my, my book wasn't out yet, so she, she could have gone to my book. <laughs> Hopefully that when this happens again and Brad is out there throwing these things all over the... The, the, uh, the Colorado rural areas, this, uh, they'll, they'll use my book. So, let's get back to the skull of doom here. So what about the information that, that Coach and, and others had learned about Anne Mitchell Hedges, her swashbuckling father, and the skull of doom? Well, although dramatic, the skull of doom story is only myth and legend, very much like the, uh, the San Luis skull story. Mr. Mitchell Hedges was not, in fact, the brave adventurer that he claimed to be. In fact, writer Joe Nickel, a friend of mine at uh, CSI, refers to Mitchell Hedges as a, quote, habitual liar and faker, who was revealed to have been a con man and been involved in a, in a string of lies and scandals, ranging from financial fraud to adultery and various other scoundrel ne'er-do-well things at the time. So he, uh, he, he poses himself as this crystal amazing scientist, blah, 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 it's like, yeah, he's uh, telling a lot of tall tales here. So you look at the, so when you, when you look at what exactly did he claim about the, about finding the crystal skulls here? What where did this come from? Well, oddly enough, or actually probably not oddly enough, once you know the story, he told several different stories about how he came to possess the skull. He originally claimed that he and not his daughter Anna had found it. Well, this is kind of important detail. Did you find this amazing, once unique thing, or didn't you? Well, uh, he made no effort, he made no references to the skull at the time upon his return uh, from Lubantu in the following decade until 1936. So the story you're supposed to believe is that he found this amazing skull. I'll just you know go from there. And he finds this thing. It's you know it's mystical powers, and uh, the ancient, the Mayan prophecies are telling him how amazing it is and unique it is. And this is the, and he's like, I'm not going to tell anybody. Yeah, just, I'll just, no, I didn't find anything interesting. No, it's boring. Mosquitoes. No, nothing. You wouldn't want to go. There's nothing interesting, no. So somehow he, he neglected to mention this amazing find for a, over a decade, uh, which is a, a, bit, a bit dodgy in my book, but there you go. Anna also changed her story several times about finding the skull. In fact, there is no evidence that she was ever at Lubantun at all. As far as we know, she was never, never at the site. She may have been in British Honduras, because we know that she accompanied her father in various places around the world, but there's no record of her being at Lubantun at all. The fact is, the truth is, that uh, Mitchell Hedges bought the skull from a collector named Sidney Burney in 1933, which he later sold to pay a debt. It was later purchased by Anna, his daughter, who made up a romantic adventure story about finding it on her 17th birthday in the jungle ruins of a lost city. So this is, this is where it sort of gets even more interesting, is that, is that you, you, have, you have this, this, and again, it's all strongly influenced by Indiana Jones. It, it's just remarkable how you've got, you've got the, real, the supposed real life story being influenced by fictional stories and this whole, this whole cycle of influence. So what about, but again, so hold on here. If, if, this, if, if there's all sorts of, of, are you feeling okay? Did you get, anybody feel weird? I mean, any heart attacks? Are we okay? No drop dead touching this amazing piece of, okay, good. Your, your throat, throat, beautiful, her, 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 her uh, sore throat is gone. Is any, any of those arthritis clearing up after touching this? Uh, nothing? Okay, all right. Bursitis is better, excellent, yeah. Uh, 
it, it'll improve, uh, you know, your hearing, libido, take your pick. You can, I'll, uh, later on, uh, I'll, uh, I'll offer an individual, you know, 20 bucks a pop, you can, you know, touch it. Benny Hinn has nothing on me, exactly. So, so hold on here. So what about, but, but remember, remember, uh, Mitchell Hedges' skull was, was apparently scientifically proven, right? Frank Dorland, that's what he said, it's in the books, read it, it's in the book, must be true, right? Frank Dorland said he had scientists and crystallographers at Hewlett Packard look at this. What did the supposed scientists who declared it that it was, quote, impossible? Well, I, I, got a hold, uh, I got a hold of the Hewlett Packard report, uh, thanks to Daniel Loxton of uh, June, your skeptic magazine, a uh, wonderful researcher in his own right who did lots of research, uh, and he's credited with some of it here. Uh, I, I read it, and I'm like, well, you know, so, you know, what about the stories of it? Uh, it you know, it always, it's always 70 degrees, no matter what. You put it in the freezer, 70 degrees. Put it in a fire, 70 degrees. Because that would be, you know, unusual, probably remarkable, super, uh, supernatural. Well, here's what they did. The scientists, for the Mitchell Hedges skull, the lab performed two significant tests. The lab people first determined that it was almost certainly uh, a single uh, quartz of crystal, that it wasn't several pieces as some of the other crystal skulls are. Next, they probed the lower jaw question. Was it originally an integral part of the crystal? That is, you know, was, was it somehow fused or was all one piece? And the orientation of its xy axis and the veils revealed, the polarized, revealed by polarized light showed that it had indeed come from the same crystal. None of the other supposed verified abilities, such as keeping a specific temperature, were done. So when Frank Dorland wrote in his books, oh, they did all these things, the, the scientists are stumped, they, they verified all this, bullshit. All they found was that it's made of a piece of crystal, which they knew, <laughs> and, that, and that the skull, it's all one piece. This is, there's, there's nothing there. They, they, he didn't, now, did he lie about it? Probably, yeah. Um, I mean, there, there, you, can't, you, can't, you can't read the Hewlett Packard report and think that there's no plausible way you go, oh, this is what they, this is not what they said. So again, he, this was the 1970s. He's, he's trying to flog his books and his, his uh, well, now I was going to say DVDs of VHS at the time. Well, later on. As for the 300 man years of work, that was only if it was carved by hand. So, so again, you know, the, so, so it is true that the Hewlett Packard scientists said, if this was done using sand and water, it would take 300 man years of work. If it's not done by sand and water, it could have taken a couple hours. So, you know, <laughs> it's, you have to work at your premises here, right? So there's other crystal skulls around there. Uh, you don't expect you to read the whole thing. That's just a little piece on, on some of the other crystal skulls. Uh, traces of tool marks remain from its carving. Moles have been made of these indentations using special silicon dental wax, and they've been examined at high magnification. Uh, and they've revealed, uh, this is uh, not only the Mitchell Hedges skull, but others as well, including the, the one in the British Museum, that uh, they, there's clear evidence of uh, rotary uh, tools, which, which certainly don't date back, uh, you know, before, the, before you know, 200, 200 years ago. And it wasn't available in, after the Spanish conquest until after in, in, in uh, 1521, so it cannot be of Aztec manufacture. So again, this is part of the, this is part of the, the New Age lore, is that it's a connection to, it's sort of the, the, the noble savage uh, theme that you often find in the New Age. Like, well, you know, the Mayan calendar, those Mayans, they must have known something. You know, they're, they're ancient. I mean, they, their calendar, it's like, what? It's a calendar. <laughs> 2012? Yeah, that came and went. <laughs> what's, your, what's your point here? Over and over and over again, in the, particularly in New Age circles, you see this sort of, this, this curious reverence for, for the unknown, the exotic, the mystical. The Native Americans did this. The Mayans did this. The Aztecs did this. And what? That's great. I'm not knocking them, but just because it's Mayan or Aztec doesn't mean that anything special about it. Uh, so it turns out that uh, the British Museum, um, the one that's in the British Museum, it was actually um, owned by a guy named Eugene Boban, a collector who's known to have dealt in both genuine and fake Mexican antiques. Uh, and that's him there. It's not a great photo, but there it is. So despite all the ac experts and new age agers and psychics and all the wild conjecture about all these things, all the talk of Atlantean princesses and the visions and the, 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 the cosmonauts and everything else, the extraterrestri extraterrestrial space brothers, Akbar and Jehoshaphat, 
If I ever have extraterrestrial staplers, I'm going to do Akbar and Joseph at. It's like straight out of a, co- a comic, right? And all the messages and all the visions. Now, keep in mind, people have written entire books on the visions that they've gotten from hanging around and channeling these things. They're, they're, they're serious about this. <laughs> they're like, they, they truly believe that they're getting these visions here. The fact is that the crystal skulls were made in the last century by talent, talented European carvers. Uh, nothing else. So anyway, uh, I'm going to leave some time for Q&A uh, because it's, it's, it's uh, frankly, that's the part that I find most interesting about these things. Uh, here's a couple of my books, uh, Scientific Paranormal Investigation, Tracking Chupacabra, and uh, again, there's a section on crystal skulls in my new book. So, uh, questions, comments, I'll pause for applause. There we go, there we go, Woo! There. Get, ask me some good questions. I'll see what I can do. Don't make us play the song. Don't make us play the song. Did you play the song earlier last time? Okay, good. Hey, so that skull you passed around, and it has that flat spot on it, so it sits? Yep. Does the real one have that? Yep. Those people are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, actually, actually, here's, here's what happened. Oh, oh, and the great part about it is the Donna was actually offered $20,000. $20,000, and she's like, no, no, I have an amazing, unique, okay, suddenly it's a glass paperweight, a second <laughs> of all things. So yes, actually, this, this was made by Brad Chavez, uh, the same guy, and it's from the same batch, actually. He says it's identical. I mean, the, the, I think Donna Coach still has it. Um, she has hers, and she's not going to let that go, but this is, yeah, it's, it's, it's made by the same guy in the same batch. He says it's identical, so... Is she still, uh, well, here's the deal. Um, what happened was that, that uh, br- after the story, after the truth came out about the origin of this, this, this glass, not crystal skull, uh, Brad, he got to laugh. He's like, he's like, seriously? He's like, I make these. Like, wh- you know, I d- he had no idea that, that this was being, ta- that one of his paperweights was being revered and worshipped. <laughs> he's like, wow, yeah, you know, it must be ego boost, right? So, so what Brad did was, uh, at first he just laughed about it. He's like, well, this is ridiculous. You know, I, this, is, this is so absurd. And he, and he, he told people, because at the Dev, Denver Museum, he had to, it's like, yeah, that's mine. I've done that. I've got other ones here, you can, if you don't believe me. So what happened was, he, he thought it was all going to vanish and go away. Well, three months later, he sees something in the paper. She's still, she's still charging people $200 a day to come sit near his paperweight. And, he, and he's like, oh, no, this has gone too far. So he wrote a piece in the, in the newspaper saying, look, she, you know, she, and, the, you know, she, and what, he, what he told me was that she should have known, she must have known, because she, she knew him by sight, because he was her neighbor. I mean, that's, they, they own property next to each other. So it wasn't like she never heard of him. I mean, she, she, didn't, she knew he was a glass blower. Um, but, but so, yeah, so they, they um, you know, after what after that, you know, he said, "Look, this is this has gone too far. Uh, my paperweight is not magical. <laughs> I appreciate the thought." Um, and so finally, uh, finally, after he raised a stink about it, she she backed down. Um, she probably wishes she'd taken that that twenty grand <laughs> for it now. But then there's another wrinkle here. I'll just throw this out: is that according to one of the stories that I heard, uh, oh, I talked to Brad about it. And, and actually, nobody had actually talked to Brad about this before. I was, I was actually the first person to track him down, because this happened 20, 20 years ago. Uh, I tracked him down, and I was telling the whole, getting the whole story from him. And he said, yeah, um, that when he, when he left the skull there, he didn't leave it out in the open. He actually put it inside a Crown Royale bag out on the, on, on the mesa there. Now think about this. This is interesting. Now, now back up here because one of the stories was that a ranch hand, not Donna Koch herself, but one of her ranch hands, went over and found it and brought it back to her. That she didn't stumble across it. Someone else went over there, and, and this would explain why it was completely clean. Think about this for a second. So here, here's what might have happened: is that her ranch hand, a teenager. Goes, he sees this weird thing. What's this, what's this Crown Royal bag doing here? He pulls it out of there. He leaves that there. He goes back and says, I found this over there. What the hell is that? She has no, I mean, it wasn't a trick. I mean, he, you know, she didn't, he didn't have it a second ago. So, he, so I think that she never actually went over and saw this. 
Because, of course, if, if – so there may be some hoaxing going on here because – I mean, I don't think that the person that found it, the, the teenage ranch hand, was in, was in on the hoax. But there may have been some – I mean, you – the Crown Royale bag kind of gives it away. This is probably not Atlantean, you know, ancient Mayan stuff in there. So, anyway, question. Um, do the original two, do they have any monetary value in terms of being an antique or craft, craftsmanship? And what would the value be of those? That's a great question. Uh, the, the, uh, the original two would be, uh, you know, there's the, the, the most famous one is the one in the British Museum, uh, which is actually right there. Um, and the, um, and the, uh, the Mitchell Hedges skull. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the... Uh, uh, obviously, you know, Donna's isn't, isn't worth anything. Um, the one in the British Museum, I mean, they are, this is the thing, is they, they are amazing pieces of work. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm, a, I'm not knocking them at all. They are, they're remarkable pieces. I mean, this is not easy to do. Uh, carving crystal, all one piece. So they absolutely have monetary value. Uh, I don't know anyone's actually appraised them. C I would guess certainly, you know, over a million dollars, several, maybe several million. I mean, there's, there's only, when you talk about skulls that are this size or bigger, there's, there's three or four in the world. Uh, so make of that what you will. So again, it, you know, even apart from all the New Age mysticism, the remarkable pieces of work, and I, I, you give full credit to them, but the fact is that they were made, you know, 150 years ago, not 30,000 years ago, and one that was made by a guy named Brad <laughs> 20 years ago. <laughs> so, from Atlantis, right. Any other questions? So, come on, someone's got something. We got eight minutes here. I'm not, don't make him play the song. Because he will play the song, won't you? Okay. Was, uh, did the, song, did the uh, engineers at HP, uh, there was something about it being a crystal, but it was glass, so I'm a little bit confused about that. No, the, H, uh, the, the engineers at HP confirmed it was, in fact, a, a single uh, quartz crystal. So there was no there was no glass in this skull. I mean, again, that was he, this is the Mitchell Hedges skull, which is absolutely genuine crystal skull. Yeah. So, but again, all, the thing is that you know, again, the the only parts that they that they verified were were the were frankly the kind of most obvious parts. Uh, nothing about all the new agey misty mystically things. All that was completely made up, uh, or badly mis badly badly misunderstood by Frank Dorland. Uh, I, I'm guessing he just wanted to sell some, some books. Well, I'm not a geologist, um, but I'm wondering, can crystals be carbon dated or at least tested for the age of that particular rock? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, uh, I don't know, I don't think, I could be wrong, I'm not a geologist. I don't think that you can actually carbon date crystal per se. Uh, you can you can look at other factors. For example, the the if it's found in 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 a, in a geological strata, you can you can identify it through that. But I mean, to the best of my knowledge, there you can't you can't you know there, there's nothing inherent in the in the in the structure of this crystal that would tell you when it was formed. Uh, you you might be able to tell when it was carved uh, again by. By, by, by the markings on it and how recent they are and how, how weathered it is. But um, I don't think there's any actual way to, to do that. One more question. Oh, another question. <laughs> Excellent. Um, many, many years ago, I watched either a Discovery or um, TLC show about the discovery of crystal skulls in one particular location in South America. And they were claiming that if they just added one more skull, they could f discover the secrets of the universe and what the aliens were go trying to tell us. Yes. Do yes. you remember that show? Yes. In fact, that's, uh, that's one. There's all sorts of folklore behind crystal skulls. I didn't have time to go into it here. But yeah, there are all sorts of amazing folklore behind it. One of the stories is, and this is actually repeated by, uh, by uh, Dan Aykroyd, who's probably been sampling his own, his own product there. Um, <laughs> He, he goes into it talking about how, uh, in his belief in that, that there's actually 13 crystal skulls. That according, to, according to one story, there's 13 original crystal skulls, and that several of them have been found. Mitchell Hudges is one of them. The one in the British Museum is the second one. Uh, and depending on who you talk to or what version of the legend you read, they have found 12 of them, and there's, you know, one left to find. And you, then that's where you sort of get into the, the, uh, the Indiana Jones-type type folklore behind it. 
Um, and uh, and so that the, and actually when when Steven Spielberg uh, he's always in fa- like like Dan Aykroyd he was always fascinated by the Crystal Skulls uh, and he, I don't I've never spoken to him he doesn't return my calls these days but um, but when Spielberg was, was writing this I mean I was reading an uh, interview with him he says yeah he's always been fascinated by this stuff I, I don't know if he believes it or not but you know certainly it's certainly rich in folklore and mythology so it, it's a natural for for Indiana Jones. Uh, but yeah, there's all sorts of stories and, and, and legends behind that, um, and and you know there's there's the the woman that was talking about how she believed that the skull was was of an Atlantean princess. She talked about how um, there were uh, whoa, oh, oh, God, whoa, almost fell off there. Don't want to curse us all. <laughs> um, she talked about how uh, there were there were supposed to be five you know there were. Five skulls, this is one of them, and that the other ones would be found and the rest of her body would actually be found crystallized. So according, this is the story is that we found her skull, and then if you guys just keep looking uh, in, around in Central America, presumably around Lubantun or you know, uh, that, that in, in Belize, that if you keep looking, you will find the, you know, crystal tibia, crystal, crystallized, whatever else. Uh, I just, you know, part of the, this is part of the thing that, that, that always creeps me out is that, you know, you have these people who basically pull the stuff out of their ass. And other people, they, 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 oh, my God, this person just said this. So I have to wonder whether someone didn't read that and think, well, that must be true. Let me go spend five years of my life looking for the rest of this Atlantis princess's crystallized body. And this, this, you know, this is always, this is the thing that I always try to point out to people is, you know, Question your assumptions. You know, under, examine the premises underlying what you're believing. Because if you believe that, if, you, if you're taking her story as true, and presumably some people did, then, you know, where do you go from there? If you truly believe this, the same thing with uh, the Lost, Lost Dutchman Mines or, you know, the, the Area 51. There's all, there's all sorts of, of stories out there where the idea is that if you just keep looking, if you, oh, it's all, the truth is out there if you keep digging, and, and I, you know, I, I, I actually take it back to, um, to a guy that I met at, at Loch Ness, uh, in Inverness. And he'd been searching for the Loch Ness Monster for, for uh, I think, at that point, 20 years. And I was talking to him, a sincere guy, just, real, you know, very nice guy, a little off, I'll be honest, but, but a, a nice guy. And it just occurred to me, it's like, what would it, what would it be like to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars and years of your life, decades of your life, dedicated to finding Nessie or finding some crystal skull, finding this and that. And because you just sort of blindly accepted, well, this must be true, you didn't dig into it, you just, oh, well, well, think about that for a second. I mean, th- this is, there are people who've done that. I mean, you know, th- I, I know, I've met people who have spent decades looking for Bigfoot. And, you know, I kind of admire their perseverance, but I just, I was like, wow. I mean, I, I, I hope for their sake that there's Bigfoot out there because how, do you, how else do you justify having spent that much time and effort on it? So, anyway, I'm going to wrap up. Oh, oh, well, we got a good question. I see a good question there. So, I, I actually knew uh, some older guys from Hewlett Packard and... I have no idea if this is related to yours, but they used to uh, joke when they're estimating projects. They'd say, well, if we'd carve this thing out of mahogany, it would be a million dollars. <laughs> We're going to make it out of aluminum. We can save nearly a million dollars. So I wonder if it's the same philosophy. Well, if we made this crystal skull out of some, with sand, it would have taken 400 man years. There but if go. we use this tool, look at the size. We can save 300 man years. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> that's, that's science, guys. It's science. It's science. It's science. <laughs> I mean, the savings are galore, but have you ever had someone take your studies and use them to support something totally unrelated like they do with the crystal? Uh, on occasion, uh, you know, typically I try to make my stuff as am- unambiguously skeptical <laughs> as I can, just so that it's not taken out of context. Uh, on occasion, I've come across some of my work uh, and research and investigations on, on, on basically use sort of being contorted and twisted around. The most recent case was really kind of bizarre. It's a little off topic, but uh, in the debate between Bill Nye and Ken Ham, that was a couple months ago. Uh, there you go. Give it, get it for, for Bill. Uh, I, uh, there was, you know, the televised debate and the, the creationist thing, and, and Bill was doing his thing. And 
a few minutes into it, Ken Ham, asshole that he is, um, puts, puts a quote from me up on his slides. I'm like, me, really, dude? You're quoting me? If you're quoting me to, su to support your arguments about creationism, you got problems. You are badly misinformed if you're going to quote me. Let's keep that in mind. So that, that was my most recent. I was like, it's like no, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, it was a correct quote. It was, a, it was to be fair, he, well, what, he, what was it? it was, he wasn't quoting a factual thing. He was, I had written a piece for Discovery News, because I, I do articles for Discovery, and, um, and I, was, I was writing about whether, whether it's a good idea for creationists to, to be debated by, by scientists, like Bill Nye and all this. And I gave a, a decent analysis. I mean, I didn't come down either way. I just said, you know, there, there are pitfalls. You know, there's, there's reasons to, to go for this and reasons not to. And I, so I just, he basically twisted what I'd said to make it sound like I was saying, Bill, please don't, 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 don't debate him. You'll be ruined. I was like, Bill, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna demolish him, but go ahead. So that, that's sort of what he did. So it was a little awkward. We're out of time. So anyway, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.